So in our third lecture on the SOLO model, we're going to take the model to data. We're going to see whether the model is consistent with the basic facts of economic growth. Let's take a look. So from our previous lectures, we know that in the SOLO model, GDP per capita is a positive function of savings or investment, positive function of human capital, and a negative function of population growth. So from this point of view, the secret to development is quite simple is to follow what uh, Bill Easterly has called the Victorian values. Work hard and save, study hard, and don't have too much sex. That is limit childbearing. So let's see for some data whether this, these predictions hold up. So what we're showing here is the relationship between real GDP per capita in 2005, where we're thinking about this as sort of the steady state level of GDP per capita and the mean or average investment rate over the previous 35 years. And what we're showing is that countries which invested more over those 35 years, they ended up with a higher level of GDP per capita. So quite consistent with the SOLO model. By the way, I've taken the data here from David Weil's book, uh, Economic Growth. This is a textbook. Uh, it's very good. You may want to take a look at that. Our second bit of data looks at real GDP per capita against the average years of schooling. And again, we see a pretty nice, close, tight relationship. More years of schooling, more human capital, greater GDP per capita. Now, of course, the causality here could be going the other way. Perhaps it's just in rich countries that people you know, have a lot of schooling because schooling can be fun, at least for some of us, not for all of us. So that's possible too, but nevertheless, the basic facts are consistent with the SOLO model. So here we're showing the um, average or mean population growth rate over the previous 35 years. Again, real GDP per capita on the vertical axis. And we see, as the SOLO model predicts, a negative relationship between the population growth rate and real GDP per capita. Now again here, the causality is not necessarily all running from the population growth rate to real GDP per, per capita. Perhaps in poor countries, they have more children. Perhaps they have more children because that's one of the only ways in which they can save for retirement. That is, have somebody there, have a child there to take care of them. So there's different interpretations. Nevertheless, um, the prediction is consistent with the SOLO model. Looking pretty good for the SOLO model. The SOLO model, however, offers more than just qualitative predictions. Uh, by putting a little bit more structure on the model, we can actually get some quantitative predictions. And that's really what we want to do. So let's take a closer look. So let's remember that the key to the SOLO model is that you reach the steady state when investment is equal to depreciation. Now let's take the equations for investment and depreciation and set that up. So that means that taking the investment here and depreciation here, the steady state is found when this equation is true. Now let's remember that the y here, this is uh, output per person, okay, that is equal to A times the capital labor ratio to the uh, power of alpha. So let's just substitute that in, okay, right there, substitute for y, we get this. So here is our equation for the steady state. So let's work a little bit with our equation and see whether we can get some more quantitative predictions out of that. Okay, here's the same uh, equation that we had on the previous page, just to remind us. Now, let's work with this equation a little bit. Let's divide both sides by k to the power of alpha. So if we do that, we get this, all right? Now, what we want to do is isolate k. So let's take both sides of this equation and uh, take them to the power of 1 over 1 minus alpha. Okay, that's going to get rid of this term here. So if we do that, and then we uh, move k over here, we just rearrange, put this stuff over here, what we get is this equation. And lo and behold, this is the steady state level of k, steady state level of capital, or the capital, excuse me, the steady state capital labor ratio. And I've marked it with a star, just indicating this is the steady state level. And what we've done here is we've expressed the steady state level of capital in terms of these exogenous factors, in terms of the savings rate, 
the depreciation rate, the population growth rate, the technology term uh, A, and this term alpha, which is a term on the production function. It's going to turn out to be important, and we'll be going to be talking about alpha a little bit more. So for now, however, uh, we have isolated the steady state level of capital. So from our previous slide, we know that the steady state level of capital is given by this expression. We also remember that output per worker is equal to A times the capital labor ratio uh, to the power of uh, this alpha term. And so substituting, if we substitute this in for here, the capital labor ratio here, then we'll get the steady state level of output per worker. Pretty straightforward. The only possible complication is there's an A out here, there's also an A within the parentheses here, and when you combine them and bring them outside the parentheses, this is what you get. So this is the level of steady state per worker given by the SOLO model. It depends upon, in particular, these fundamental factors here. So the next thing we're going to want to ask is, suppose we want to compare do two different countries. The SOLO model says any differences in output per worker must be due to the differences in these fundamental factors. So let's ask, suppose that the savings rate were different in two different countries. How much of the differences in output per worker which we observe in the world can be explained by reasonably sized differences in these fundamental factors? And we're going to focus on the savings rate, but we could do similar exercises for the other ones as well. So that's the question we're going to ask next. This looks slightly imposing, but it's really not. We're going to compare two different countries by looking at the ratio of their GDPs per capita. So from the previous slide, we know that the steady state GDP per capita for the United States is given by this expression here, according to the SOLA model. And the steady state ratio of GDP per capita for, let's say, Zambia or Zimbabwe it's given by, again, according to the SOLO model, by this expression here. Now let's suppose that everything in these two countries was the same except for the savings rate. If that's the case, then a bunch of these terms are going to drop out, and you'll see that the difference in GDP per capita is explained by the differences in the savings rate. So in particular, let's suppose that this ratio of savings rate, suppose the ratio was 4. That is, suppose that the United States saved four times as much as Zambia. In particular, let's imagine, this is not the case, but let's imagine that the United States saved 20% of its output and Zambia saved 5% of its output. So the savings rates differed by a factor of four. If that was the case, how large a difference in GDP per capita could we explain based upon a difference in savings rates, difference in the ratio of 4. Well, that turns out is going to depend upon this alpha over 1 minus alpha term. And that's what we're going to be looking at next. So the question, once again, is suppose that savings rates differed by a ratio of 4. How much could that ratio of 4 explain in terms of ratios of GDP per capita. So what this graph tells us is that if alpha is small, then a difference in savings rates of 4, a ratio of 4, that's only going to be able to explain a fairly small difference in the income ratios across countries. On the other hand, if alpha is large, if alpha is over here, OK, then we're going, we're going to be able to explain a large, differences, large difference in the income ratios by a fairly modest difference, a reasonable difference in the savings rate. Okay. So if alpha is big and the savings rate differs by a factor of four, then we're going to be able to explain differences in GDP per capita across countries of 30, 30 times difference. A four times savings rate difference is going to translate into a 30 times difference in GDP per capita if alpha is big. But if alpha is small, a four times difference of uh, savings rates is only going to be able to explain a small fraction of the difference in GDP per capita across countries. So what is alpha, and how big is it?
So how big is alpha? Well, in order to get a grip on this equation, we need some way of connecting alpha with something which we can measure in the real world. And to do that, we need to make some assumptions. We're going to assume uh, reasonably competitive markets, and we're going to assume that the bulk of uh, ideas, we don't have to pay for this. So, you know, pasteurization, uh, Newton's laws, these are all available to us sort of free of charge, uh, as it were. Of course, you still have to pay for capital, and you still have to pay for labor, educated labor, which understands these issues. Um, but you don't have to pay for the ideas themselves. That's uh, A, in other words, is a, public, is a public good. Okay. Both of these assumptions are not bad. Not perfectly true, of course, but they're going to get us quite a, uh, quite a way, so they're worthwhile making these assumptions, even if they're not perfectly true. If we do this, if we make these assumptions, then in particular, the wage will be equal to the marginal product of labor. Okay? With competitive markets, the wage is going to be equal to the marginal product of labor. Okay? And the marginal product of labor is the derivative of output with respect to L, which is this expression right here. Okay? Now let's take the wage and multiply it by L. Okay? That gives us the total payments to labor. If we then divide by Y, this gives us the fraction of output which goes to labor, or labor's share in national income. Okay? So this is labor's share in national income. Now in terms of our expression, it's just this. And you can see there's a bunch of things we can divide and okay, cancel out. And what we have is this. Nice expression, whoa. It turns out that labor's share of national income is equal to 1 minus alpha. Or in other words, we can find this number in the national accounts. So if you go to the national accounts, what you can find is that labor's share of income is about two-thirds. You know, wages and labor compensation, that covers the bulk of GDP. That covers the bulk of national income, okay, closely related after you take into account depreciation and so forth. So in other words, if 1 minus alpha is equal to two-thirds, alpha is equal to one-third. Okay, let's go back and look at our diagram. Okay, here's our diagram again, and uh-oh, if alpha is equal to one-third, then we're only going to be able to explain an income ratio of two with a savings ratio of four. In other words, if alpha is equal to one-third, the SOLO model is going to have real difficulty explaining large income ratios even with you know, pretty large size savings ratios. You know, any reasonably sized savings ratio is not going to be able to explain the income ratios we observe in the real world when alpha is equal to one-third. All right. Well, Mankiw, Romer, and Weil, famous paper, they said, well, they made two points. They said, first, if alpha is equal to 0.6, then the SOLA model actually does pretty well at explaining differences in income across countries. Moreover, they said, an alpha equal to 0.6, that's actually not too bad because labor's share isn't really about payments to pure labor. The payment to labor's share also represents a payment to human capital. And human capital, education, takes time to produce. So human capital really ought to be considered a type of capital, hence the name. And if you think about human capital as capital, then capital's share, which is alpha, it's not at all unreasonable then to think that alpha is equal to 0.6. However, this is not the end of the story for a couple of reasons. One objection I have is that if it were really the case that the differences in income ratios was explained by savings ratios and also by human capital, you know, why isn't everyone rich then? You know, could it really be the case that what is holding back poor countries is a failure to save? That seems really hard to believe. Like if you went to a poor country and you said, if only you saved you know, a little bit more than you're saving now, not that much more, but if only you saved more, then within a generation, you would be much, much richer than you are now. I think they would do it. Or to put it differently, a foreign aid would work much better than it actually does if all it took to generate growth was a difference in savings rate. And we could push their savings even temporarily higher. That would increase their income. And then it could very well uh, snowball, could very well keep going. 
So uh, I don't think the difference is really savings rate. There's also a couple of other objections, even when alpha is equal to 0.6, and we'll deal with those next. The SOLO model also has implications for interest rates and skilled wages, and thus for capital and labor flows. And here again, we're going to see that its SOLO model is really not capable of explaining some of the basic facts. In particular, if poor countries are poor because they lack capital and skilled labor, then the return on capital and skilled labor should be much higher in poor countries. But is this true? No, it's not true. So if anything, what we observe is that capital and skilled labor flow from poor to rich countries. So think about a, a doctor, physician. Physicians in Africa would like to come practice in the United States where their income would be much higher. We don't see a lot of physicians in the United States moving to Africa in order to make a higher income. The same thing is true with uh, capital. We don't see massively high interest rates in poorer countries. And we don't see capital flowing from rich countries to poor countries. You know, unfortunately, or in fact, what we see quite often is rich people in poor countries want to take their capital abroad, want to invest in richer countries. So all of these things suggest that a higher alpha is not going to solve all the problems, and it suggests that the SOLO model, taken as a model of uh, capital investment, and capital investment as a source of growth, is not going to be able to explain all of the big differences in income ratios which we observe in the real world. To get us really there, we're going to have to add some things to the model. We're going to have to take into account the possibility of differences in productivity across nations. And that's something we'll look at in the next video. Thanks.